Welcome back to Art of Story. I'm Adam Argo. I'm a writer, director, story artist, and the author of Story by Numbers, a deep dive into story structure, character, and theme. Before we jump in, I want to remind you that we have the Scene Structure Intensive coming up on April 13th. That's Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's an online live event with me where I'm going to do a deep dive into scene mechanics. As part of the intensive, we're going to be using a document, a scene structure diagram that goes through beats and subtext and how to achieve that turn that every scene needs to have in order to have the emotional punch. This will be a two hour live presentation with a Q&A at the end. So registration opens tomorrow, Tuesday, April 2nd at 10 a.m. So the last intensive we had sold out in half an hour. So you want to make sure that you're there on time just to make sure that you get your spot. So today we want to dive back into page one. And why are we emphasizing so much of page one? Mainly because page one is your first impression. Most readers, most producers have already made their decision about whether you're a good writer or not just by glancing at page one. Usually you can tell at a glance if this person knows what they're doing. They might read the entire script, but usually within the first page, they've decided if you're competent or not. And if they've decided you're not competent, then every other page after that feels like a slog. Whereas if you win them over on the first page, it kind of works as kind of they're giving you the benefit of the doubt, any kind of flaws after that. Of course, you want to focus on having your entire script read smoothly, clean, clear, but the first page really sets up the pace of how they're going to read it. And they know if this is somebody that knows what they're doing. So we focus on the first page and then you apply all these lessons across the entire script. I get a lot of scripts where literally I know by the first page, okay, this person doesn't understand how to think cinematically. This person's really struggling with, with the formatting. They haven't quite figured out what the conventions are. Um, and most importantly, they're thinking so abstractly that they're not conveying the images that they need to. You still have to have all of the machinations of subtext and plot structure, um, but you're adapting all of those elements of drama into a very specific format, which is cinematic visual storytelling. Here are the four essentials that you need to have on your page one. We want to show that we understand the craft, demonstrate that we're thinking cinematically, lure the reader, and use spectacle. Now, today I want to kind of dial into a little bit of this idea of like um, showing that we understand the craft. And last week we talked about writing economically, solid formatting, and avoiding brick walls of paragraphs. Now, this also lends itself to thinking cinematically because we want to think primarily in shots. We want to convey the language of the camera without directing. You don't want to put in there wide shot, medium shot, close up. You want to instead infer or imply what the camera is looking at by activating a subject of a shot. So for example, fingers glide across the page. That implies a close up. The sun casts a shadow across the valley. That implies a wide shot. That's the job of the director. They want to read the screenplay and they will start to come up with their own kind of interpretation of the script and they will deviate from whatever shots you think that you want to convey. However, you want to show that you're thinking as a director without giving a shot list. Now the shot list is what the director will do when they read the script. They come up with the process of interpreting your script and translating that for the camera. But what you want to do is convey the story and show that you understand film grammar without ever dictating a shot list. Today we're going to be looking at the first page of The Fall by Peter Bridges. Now as an ideal example of what I'm talking about, I wanted to look at a uh, a, a very successful, beautifully written script that completely changed the way I look at screenwriting once I read this. this literally, after I read this script, I changed a lot of my approach to how I lay words on the page and how I format. The log line reads like this. In the midst of an alien invasion, a freshly divorced couple must survive a dangerous real-time journey on foot from downtown Atlanta to the suburbs where their young children are home alone. Lots of strong elements. This is Two characters in conflict, in personal conflict, personal turmoil, alien invasion. They need to get home, take care of their kids. These are two people who have decided they do not work well together. They're going to have to work together. So we know that this is an alien invasion, sci-fi thriller. So you know that this is going to be a, a really great ride. Okay, let's look at just the page one. Now, the interesting thing is this is this is an unusual convention. Usually you don't want to do this. Uh, he's breaking a lot of conventions in this, but it works so perfectly. The very first page, it says, real time one shot okay so this is part of the high concept of it is that they're doing kind of a whole feature as a oneer, kind of like in the vein of like birdman 
uh, where they they kind of hid the shots. The camera's continuously moving, and every time there was a cut or something, they hid it as if it was a continuous uh, movement. They kept the transition. So, for example, someone would cross in front of the camera, and they would use that cross in front of the camera to cut or wipe, um, which comes down to the director trying to figure out how they would execute this. But remember, the screenwriter has to think first, how are they going to convey this as a one -er? And then he went ahead and included a, uh, a map. Such a cool detail. All right, let's read the first page. On white, paper shuffling and pens write on a document. Last page folded over the top. Two sign here arrow stickers. Male hands signing at the first arrow, Samuel Gerard. Moving aside for female hands signing at the second arrow, Megan Gerard. Attorney's office, Sam, 40s. Watches Megan, 40s, finish signing. An attorney, 50s, signing the row of copies next to her. She finishes and moves over to the window. Downtown Atlanta in the fall. Green, orange, and gold beneath an overcast midday sky. Looking down on a large park among the skyscrapers. The attorney signs the last copy and stands. Sam, that's it, attorney. That's it. I filed with the judge this afternoon. He signs off on it, but that's all on your part. Why? Was there something... Sam, no, I just... I mean, 18 years and it comes down to a couple of signatures. Attorney. Hey, you did it right. Amicable and uncontested wins every time if you can. Not many can, though. But then the first divorce is always the hardest. Okay, so right off the bat, you, this is thinking cinematically. Now, some of the conventions he's breaking is, first of all, the, the slug line. Um, now, the slug line is what we use to establish the setting. Usually in production, you look at the slug line to figure out where the scene is, the location, and time of day, interior or exterior. He's not doing any of that. Uh, he's a lot. He's allowing a lot of this to just be like, well, they're inside an in attorney's office, so this is an interior. And then he uses screen direction to describe the time of day. Now, part of the reason he's doing this is because... He's just going to be using um, the location as a slug in bold. He never uses interior or exterior and he never uses the time of day because this is one continuous shot. So the time will be changing as we go. But the thing I absolutely love is right off the bat on white. So we just see this white screen paper shuffle pens writing on a document. Okay. So really strong use of M dash. He's getting us to jump from shot to shot, line to line with those M dashes, implying that something big is about to happen. He's also pacing this out just about uh, at the same pace that we would see this on screen. Two sign here, arrow stickers, male hand. So we get the close up signing at first arrow. And then we see the name. On top of that, it's a beautiful, powerful image. Two people are signing the termination of their love and their their legal contract as well and the idea that their whole relationship is being reduced to just these signatures on a piece of paper seems to betray like the depth of of time 18 years and the and the emotional commitment that these people had the subtext of it is this is this is the last day of their acquaintance uh, in the words of Sinead O'Connor, uh, this is them uh, severing their ties. So right off the bat, we're getting that this is this is an emotional moment, but the, he's doing the right thing. These are people that are not showing their emotions, but they're feeling everything below the surface, keeping it contained, keeping it below the surface, which gives us the tension that we want. I strongly recommend you go read the entire script of The Fall. It's available for educational purposes. It's really, really well written. Uh, it's thinking cinematically, and it's it's one of the the best examples I have for for what I aspire to when I'm writing, when I'm reading a screenplay and when I'm writing myself. So did you notice how clean, how sparse and how simple there was no pretense. There was no, he didn't waste his time with a whole lot of adjectives. All the verbs were clear, precise, specific. You knew exactly what you were looking at. And you also allowed the dialogue was written sparse and simple to imply a lot of subtext, but still allow the actors uh, to find the truth of the moment. Just really beautifully written. I love the script. So that's The Fall by Peter Bridges. All right, let's get into your scripts. Uh, today we have a submission from Emmanuel Gutierrez, Sirens in Her Belly. Just taking a quick look at the overview, what's your first impression? Now, the first thing I see before I even read a single word, I'm seeing lots of one-line descriptions. That's great. The slug line is in bold. It's clear it stands out without even having read any of the script. 
I feel like this is going to be a script that's going to be smooth, easy to read. Now, it could be wrong. We could dive in there and there's lots of ambiguous descriptions or anything like that. But at first glance, this feels like a smooth, easy to read page. So that's a great first glance. So first, I'm going to go through and read it exactly as it's presented. And then we'll do the deconstruction. Fade in. A white void with walls surrounding the infinite. Interior. Garden of Eden. Day. Before our eyes... A sprig matures into an obelisk-like tree, hanging from the branches. Gold-red fruit? No. Amniotic sacs filled with human fetuses, varying stages. One fetus yawns, puckers its face. Another kicks when a lovely hand plucks the fruit from the tree. Eve, 30. Albino, timeless beauty, nude, mesmerized. She marvels at the gift in her grasp caresses it against her face, gently kisses it, but her maternal gaze grows voracious. Her teeth sink and tear into the amniotic sac. Red fluid ruptures sizzling at her bare feet, gnarled toes. The infant's first cries screech in the white void, then silenced as Eve tears through the flesh and bone. Blood-soaked mouth, Eve reaches to the next branch, plucks another fruit with a charged grunt and takes pause. She spins around, ashamed, fighting tears. Adam, 30, albino, divine looks, nude, devastated. He nor Eve have genit he nor e he nor Eve have genitals, anatomically smooth, almost artificial. Adam pries the fetus from Eve, shielding it with his back, but something alluring catches his scent. He inhales her breath, tastes the blood at her lips, laps the blood down her chin, burning with insatiable desire. Adam tears the sack open with his bare hand, growling in excitation as the fluid pools at his feet. He silences the screeching babe, teeth in its jugular. Adam and Eve eye the tree's endless branches. She wipes his bloody mouth. He takes her hand and... Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that probably should have had some sort of trigger warning. So I don't even know what kind of warning you would put, but okay. Includes fetus eating. <laughs> uh, so first off, I, I'm, I love it. I, it's such a strange, bizarre experience. And I absolutely want to know what happens next. Um, this, <laughs> this is really well executed. It's, it's a strange movie. Like it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like, uh, an Aronofsky type film, uh, like poetic mythic, uh, it has kind of this, uh, artsy graphic feel to it, but it's fun. It's, it's strange and fun and jarring and a completely unique take. I absolutely Love the imagery. Um, and I, the most important thing is I absolutely can't wait to see what's on page two. Like this is, this completely grabbed me. Uh, okay, so let's let's get into structure and rewrite. Uh, fade in, transition, fine if you want to fade in. Uh, I, don't, I don't really bother with fade in anymore. Um, some people still do it. It's kind of an old convention. Uh, as, a, as an editor and stuff, I get really bored with fade ins. You want to use a fade in as, or a fade or any kind of cross dissolver transition to imply like slow transition of time. It can be a powerful tool, but anyway. But I digress. A white void with walls surrounding the infinite. Okay, so before we even get a slug, he describes uh, a white void ellipses. Now, this is a little bit of ellipses abuse. Uh, a white void. I don't know why we need the ellipses in there. Uh, with walls surrounding the infinite. So to me, I'm really confused by that. I don't know. I, the white void clear. Okay, I just see a white field on the screen. With walls surrounding the infinite. I have no idea what that means. The infinite to me implies some vast expanse and then you have walls around that vast expanse. So are we seeing the walls or are we seeing just an infinite expanse? So right off the bat, that, that image confuses me. I would stick, keep it clear, keep it simple, a white void. I'm not sure what the white void gets us before we introduce the Garden of Eden. Uh, we don't see anything happening um, and we go straight from a white void to a slug line. 
So what I would recommend is actually, let's start off with the Garden of Eden. Just give it Garden of Eden day, a white void. So you were describing the imagery before our eyes. I think that's implying that uh, in a kind of time lapse or just a, a, a spontaneous um, flourishing or blossoming. Uh, but before our eyes kind of uh, feels like a little bit of a redundant. It's a tautology. We're looking at the screen. So of course it's before our eyes. Let's start with a sprig matures into an obelisk. We'll just throw in spontaneously. A sprig spontaneously matures into an obelisk like tree hanging from the branches, a gold fruit. The question works, um, but it feels a little cute. I would say just, just throw in an M dash gold fruit. Go ahead and just give us the misdirect gold, red fruit. Maybe I'd try something like reveals itself to be amniotic sacs filled with human fetuses. I'm not sure how important to the story that it's various stages of, of maturation. Uh, just the term various stages by itself kind of throws us. So like a fetus is a specific stage of growth. Like you'd go from an embryo to a fetus. So it's enough to say amniotic sacs, unless otherwise it's a very specific like story point that you uh, reveal later. But amniotic sacs filled with human fetuses, boom. It conveys the image powerfully quickly and we go into another shot fetus yawns one fetus yawns puckers its face another kicks when a lovely hand plucks the fruit from the tree so this all happens in one shot that works really nicely amniotic sacs fill the fluid fluid good then we go to eve 30 albino timeless white so we don't need the comma after the parentheses it depends on your convention it's a little funky to put print like a whole like albino, timeless, beauty, nude, mesmerize. Just because we're getting that list in there, let's separate it. She's mesmerized, Eve mesmerized. So we want to activate it uh, just usually with just the adjective mesmerized. Uh, we want to use the adjectives to embellish on the verbs, but we really want to, especially when you're introducing somebody, we want to have that verb be active. If we try something like this, Marvel, nude. Marvel's at the... Uh, gifts now i don't know about the gift thing uh, we just want to be very clear and specific so she marvels at the fetus mesmerized caresses it against her face gently kisses it nice these are all beats this clearly you can apply a shot her maternal gaze grows voracious now this this is really interesting we don't need i wouldn't say an ellipses because we start to see the transition and then punch him in the face with that M dash. So we're interrupting the the change to her teeth sink and tear into the amniotic sac. Um, again, ellipses is there to create a kind of pause. Her teeth sink and tear into the amniotic sac. Red fluid ruptures, sizzling at her bare feet, gnarled toes. Love this. The infant's first cries screech in the white void. I'm not sure that we need white void in there because that that detail like uh, we want to stay close in the action the infant's fear first the infant's first cries screech so first cries is trying to kind of point out an irony of like the first sound it ever makes is a screech um that that's a little kind of editorial on the action the infant screeches is enough to convey the image we don't need to sit there philosophically saying oh it's their first cry the infant screeches then silenced as Eve tears through the flesh and bones. That's such a disturbing image. Blood-soaked mouth, Eve reaches to the next branch. So blood-soaked mouth, that implies that we're going to be t in tight around her mouth, and then she reaches to the next branch. I know you want to imply that her, blood, her, her mouth is covered in blood, tears through the flesh and bone. Probably move that up here. Yeah, her blood-soaked mouth is fine. Again, this goes back to sentence fragments. You don't have to have complete sentences. Eve reaches to the next branch, plucks another fruit with a charged grunt, and takes pause. Even though she, you said she takes a pause, you don't need the ellipses in there. Just a paragraph with a charged grunt. Another fruit with a charged grunt. Pauses. Does she pause or does she hesitate? So she senses somebody else is there. Adam's, Adam is there. She spins around, ashamed, fighting tears. So is Adam behind her? She spins around. So as soon as you have to sit there and try and do the, do the math of like, wait, wait. So she spins around and Adam is behind her. She's ashamed, fighting tears. Is she trying to hide the tears or is she facing him, showing her shame? 
so we want to be sure that we're, we're clear specifically on the imagery. She spins around. Maybe we want to say shame fills her face, fights tears, she turns. And again, that would be a different beat. You want to, you want to break it up into beat. She turns to Adam 30. Let's make this a clean image. And albino, divine looks, nude. Divine looks it kind of implies that, that that's an attitude that he's having. He's looking around divine. But if he appears to be divine, you can just say albino, divine, nude. Uh, maybe statuesque. I don't know if you're going for kind of the Prometheus type of uh, alien looking creatures. Um, albino, divine, nude, devastated. So this and he nor Eve have genitals. So we'll just either Adam nor Eve have genitals. Anatomically smooth. Let's put that one paragraph. Neither Adam nor Eve have genitals. Anatomically smooth, almost artificial. Okay. So I'm getting the idea that these are, you know, kind of uh, replicants or android type things, but um, but that could be me reading into it. Adam pries the fetus from Eve, shielding it with his back, but something alluring catches his scent. Just give it a... We don't need ellipses in there. He inhales her breath, tastes the blood at her lips, laps the blood... Okay. Laps the blood down her chin, <laughs> burning with insatiable desire. Adam tears the sack open with his bare hand, growling in excitation as the flood pools at his feet. Okay. So we, we cut this off just a little bit, but we get that great turn of Adam also um, dives in. So this is, I mean, this was really well written. It really was from the very beginning. Those little changes I had are just kind of tweaks to just make it very clear on the first read. You don't want anyone to read and say, wait, so where are they? Who are they? What, what, like, what, what exactly am I looking at? What am I seeing on the screen? Uh, so most of the description is fantastic. She even fills her face. So now we look at this and, um, the silence screeching the baby teeth in the jugular, Adam and Eve in the trees, endless branches, and he wipes his blood and mouth, takes her hand. Okay, so we'll we'll leave that for the page two because we get enough of this really nice ending right here. Um, he inhales her breath. Adam tears, uh, tears the sack open with his bare hands, growling in excitation as the flood pools at his feet. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a great turn. And then that's a really nice little payoff. Like at first she's kind of ashamed and she's like, Oh no, I can't believe I've done this. There's this moment of kind of, uh, sobriety, uh, shame fills her face, fights tears. She turns to Adam 30 albino, divine, new devastated, neither Adam nor Eve have genitals anatomically smooth. So then we pull out to reveal that, in that wide shot with Adam, Adam pries the fetus from Eve shielding it with her back. Uh, so first there's kind of the sense of like, Oh, he's protecting them, but something alluring catches a scent. Yeah. Great turn. This, the thing I love is it, it starts off presenting this kind of idyllic fantasy uh, mythology and then takes a really dark vampiric turn. So like this is really well written because they're constantly they're conveying the images, very powerful, compelling spectacles. And they're playing like, oh, this is going this direction. Nope, it's going this direction. Nope, it's going this direction. Nope, it's going this direction. So that's just great writing. This is really well done. Strongly recommend that I absolutely want to know what's going to happen on the next pages. And this feels like you're in really good hands. Everything I'm recommending is just nitpicking and helps a little bit with uh, with the clarity of the presentation on the screen. So great job. Really well done. And because that was such a short one, let's 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 do another one. Let's see if we can fit in another one. Today we're gonna to be reading Tressa by Keys as well. Let's do the read through exactly as it's presented and then I'll do a quick rewrite. Interior, hotel room in the tropics, day. William stands with a blank stare through his balcony at the rising sun. Blood drips down his bald head and through his five o'clock shadow in only a pair of jeans holding an almost empty bottle of rum. 
His breath is rapid and deep in a rhythmic pattern. The hotel room is trashed as if there were a fight that had just happened, but William stands alone. Title, Teresa. Exterior, military base, day. On-screen text, one year earlier. A platoon stand in formation on smooth jet black asphalt of a military parade square. It's surrounded by the perfectly cut Kentucky blue grass. A drill sergeant paces in front of them in his pressed and starched uniform. Drill sergeant. After graduation, you will receive your posting messages. If you're lucky, you'll be stationed with a deploying unit. When I dismiss you, when dismissed, head to the orderly room. The clerk will give you said messages. Is this understood? Platoon. Yes, sir. William, clean-shaven and a slight smile, adjusts to stand even straighter. Drill sergeant. Dismissed. The platoon in a blitz to the orderly room. William's first. He holds the door open for the rest. Donnie, slightly larger build, wearing a platoon leader patch, pushes his way to the front and playfully but hard punches William in the gut. Winks and heads through the door. Donnie. Fuck you, Willie. I'll save you a seat at Chow. So really strong imagery. Um, we've got some really nice elements here. When we just look at this first impressions, m my eye immediately goes to brick wall, brick wall, brick wall, brick wall. Now, the nice thing is, you know, they don't go on too long. This looks like a monologue. Um, Every single description is at least four to five lines. That implies that you're describing a lot. That's that's a big red flag. When I the first thing they're going to start seeing is like, okay, this person's describing a whole lot, which implies that they don't quite understand uh, the the formatting or the cinematic structure. Hotel room in the tropics day. It's always a hyphen in the middle, no parentheses. Interior hotel room in the tropics. So what we're gonna want is hotel room. We'll reveal that we're in the tropics in this in the in the shot. Interior. So the way we're doing this is we just start off with William stands in a blank stare through the balcony at the rising sun. Blood drips down his bald head and through his five o'clock shadow, and only pair of jeans holding an almost empty bottle of rum. His breath is rapid and deep in rhythmic pattern. Okay, so that is just an avalanche of ideas and images that we want to make sure that we're presenting them in a way that punches that's clear and it's specific. Um, his breath is rapid, uh, and deep in rhythmic pattern. Okay. What if we start off, we lead in over black, I would say rapid deep breaths. I'm not sure what the rhythmic pattern is. It, I don't know if that's like a something that that character specifically breathes in a rhythmic pattern or, but the idea is that uh, he's sounds like he just got out of a fight. So rapid, deep breaths. Okay. And then we cut to interior hotel room day. William stands in a blank stare through his balcony at the rising sun. So blank stare, but he's taking deep breaths. So what if, what if we reveal this a little bit? Okay, so the real, what we want to do is tell a story. You're you're giving us like all these images and kind of just a an avalanche of concepts and you're just kind of showing us. What if we reveal little by little? So for example, hotel room. Let's maybe imply like some like Baja kitsch carpeting. Trash and broken bottles. Tossed in a storm on the floor. Let's be a little more specific. Broken bottles, broken bottles, torn linens. Okay, so Baja style kitchen carpeting. Broken bottles, torn linens, crumpled trash, tossed in a storm across the floor. Okay, so the room is trash. This also implies that we're kind of traveling across the floor. We crawl across mess to the balcony okay baja style kitchen carpeting broken bottles torn linens crumpled trash tossed in a storm across the floor a virtual crime scene we 
We crawl across the mess to the balcony. Bare feet. Bare feet stand on broken glass. Ragged jeans. Male hand grips a rum bottle, mostly empty, lifts it to his face. So that implies that the camera tracks with the camera. Or sorry, that implies that the camera tracks with the bottle up to his face. William. I don't know how old he is. I'm guessing if he's a Marine, he's probably like 23. Pretty young. Disheveled. Shirtless. A clock shadow. Looks like shit. Actually, let's save the reveal for his face just a little bit. So we kind of crawl across the floor, see his feet, climb up the jeans. We see the bottle. As he lifts the bottle, we stay behind him. There's a bottle to his face. From behind, we see back of his bald head. Now, let's talk about we see for a second. We see is a little bit of a controversial thing. A lot of people say as soon as we say we see, we're kicking people out of the moment. Um, a lot of the idea of, of good writing is to immerse us, um, immerse us in the moment so that we don't call attention to the writing or to the camera. Now, because this is a screenplay, uh, a lot of screenwriters have developed the convention of saying we see, implying that the audience is looking at the screen and it shows uh, you're describing the image of, of what we're seeing. Some people argue that it kicks you out of the screenplay. But the truth of it is, is it's a functional convention that a lot of people adopt. And once you get used to we see, it becomes like um, like uh, the said tag. It just it just becomes invisible. Uh, we see the back of his head. Uh, it's a it's a it's a useful tool. Um, some people hate it, uh, but it really just comes down to. Uh, what works for you and what your what your writing style is. I'm a big fan of it. From behind, we see the back of his head, blood drips down his scalp. So we're we're what we're doing is we're building tension. We're, we're revealing a little bit, and we're getting the audience to guess what happened. We're getting them to put pieces together. We see a broken bottle, torn linens, crumpled trash. I don't know if we want to throw a woman's shoe in there. We uh, like little things like that 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 imply some sort of like disturbance some domestic disturbance and then uh, we're revealing the the hotel room little by little and then we crawl across the mess to the balcony bare feet stand on broken glass the idea is to just activate the bear what are they standing on or activate the feet um they don't have to be standing on broken glass we can find some other thing if you want to say that he's not you know like completely but the idea is that it, it's it's implying that he's hurt but he's not giving a shit uh ragged jeans a male hand grips a rum bottle, so we're kind of climbing up the leg to the bottle, uh, mostly empty, so he's uh, been getting shit-faced. Lifts the bottle to his face from behind. So as soon as we say lift the bottles to his face, we're going to imply that we're going to see the face. However, from behind, we see the back of his head. It implies that we're still holding on to who is this person. The longer we take to get to show his face... The more tension, the more curiosity the audience has for who this person is, the more we empower this character. Um, this was something I learned from watching Hitchcock. Uh, there's that introduction of the Cary Grant character in Notorious. And there's this great scene where they're, um, they, they introduce Cary Grant from behind. The camera pulls in. And it just has Cary Grant in the foreground, out of focus, the back of his head. And everybody walks around in the background. Now, because he's out of focus, we're focused on the people in the background and their conversation, and you're seeing how they react to him. And it creates this mysterious experience where we're like, well, who is this figure in the very center of the frame? Creates that curiosity. Um, so this is a great way to kind of like introduce a character, pull us into that cinematic, and it shows that we're thinking cinematically. And cinema means pulling us in and immersing us in a moment, getting us to feel something. So this idea, like rather than just say a messed up, fucked up hotel room, we're saying uh, we're, we're giving little pieces that you can start to put together a whole puzzle. And that's that's at the core of entertainment. You don't give them four. You give them two plus two. We're letting you put together, okay, this is a room that's been disheveled. 
and we want to know who this person is. It sounds like there's been some sort of like tussle, some fight, and we're looking at the last man standing. And we want to know who this person is. So as soon as we uh, we truck across the room, reveal that he's standing, and then we get this nice irony. We see we have we see this guy who's 23, disheveled, shirtless, five o'clock shadow, looks like shit. Maybe we make another reference to the breath. Take it takes a deep breath. How about no, let's takes a swig. Then we reveal. This kind of implies that we're going to be showing a, a wide shot. We reveal a rising sun. A rising sun spraying light across a tropical beach. Okay, so let's see how that reads. So we took our time a little bit more, but now we've created a moment. Over black, rapid deep breaths. Interior, hotel room, day. Baja style kitsch carpeting. Broken bottles, torn linens, tr uh, crumpled trash. Tossed in a storm across the floor, a virtual crime scene. And what we're doing is we're, we're saying that there's a lot more than just what we're listing in this. There's this, uh, just a massive mess. We crawl across the mess to the balcony. Bare feet stand it. So what this implies is, you know, this is about what? A tenth of the page. So it's going to be about a 10 second crawl uh, as we're probably dollying across the floor to the balcony, bare feet stand on broken glass, ragged jeans. So that describes images, it's visceral. So we see the bare feet standing on broken glass. Uh, we wanna know who this is, a male hand grips a rum bottle. Bringing back this we see, we're describing a camera shot, basically one continuous camera movement where it's dollying across and then we pedestal up to a male hand grips a rum bottle, mostly empty, lifts it to his face, this might be a little bit of over direction, um, but it does convey the moment. It does convey the action that we're seeing. We track with the bottle from behind. We see the back of his head. So the, the idea is that we're still creating mystery. We don't know who he is. As soon as we have a face, we're connecting, we're making judgments. But we see that he's bald, the blood drips down his scalp. William, 23, disheveled, shirtless, five o'clock shadow, looks like shit, takes a swig, stares off into the middle distance. A rising sp sun sprays. Let's get rid of that gerund. A rising sun sprays light across a tropical beach. A okay, title, Teresa. We don't need that for a transition. So we'll just change the element of that. Title, Teresa. And because you said it's title, we don't need the uh, quotation marks. Exterior military base day again. No parentheses. That's a cinematic way of conveying the image. On screen texts. Okay. So that is formatted not quite correctly. We'll just say that's a super with a colon. And we don't need the quotes unless you want the quotes to appear on screen one year earlier. A, pl a platoon stands. In formation and smooth jet black asphalt to the military parade squad. Really nice image. Love that. As much as I love that, it's just not a necessary description. It's it's art direction. Um, a drill sergeant paces in front of them. So we're introducing a new character. Drill sergeant, 40s. Let's, let's get specific. 45. Start with an ellipses. We don't really need to start that, even if we're cutting in in the middle of the scene. After graduation, you will receive your posting messages. If you're lucky, you'll be stationed with a deploying unit. When I dismiss you, when dismiss, head to the orderly room. The clerks will give you said. We want to write this so this is clear, specific dialogue, but also what's relevant to the character and to the story. After graduation, you'll receive your post messages. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, when I dismiss you, when dismissed, that feels like you're repeating yourself and then he just dismisses them. So it's like, there's no reason to build up to when I dismiss you, he's just going to dismiss them. Let's make this a little simpler after graduation. Head to the orderly room. If 
you your posts. If you're lucky, you'll be stationed with a deploying unit. Is this understood? Let's save that. And then we reintroduce William here. William stands at attention. Clean shaven. Let's keep this contained. A subtle smile cracks his lips. So this gives this gives us a whole journey right here. We see this horrible what we see some sort of messes taking place, some sort of disaster, a fight, whatever. He looks like shit. Something really bad has happened. We don't know what it is. Military base day. One year earlier, a pl platoon stands in formation. Drill Sergeant 45 paces in front of them in his pressed and starch uniform. After graduation, head to the orderly room. The clerks will give you your posts. If you're lucky, you'll be stationed with a deploying unit. So that's that's the thing we really want to land. If you're lucky, you'll be stationed with a deploying unit. William stands at attention, clean shaven. A subtle smile cracks his lips. William stands at attention. So that's the payoff right there. So that's enough to get us through that first page. That's a that's a nice setup. We see that there's that William is this uh, just looks like a, a complete wreck. And then we cut to one year earlier, and he's completely the opposite. Stands at attention, clean shaven, a subtle smile cracks his lips. So we see the total opposite image. We see William. So this implies that we're going to have this whole journey of how we got from the first William to the William in the hotel. That's enough to get us, like, that's enough to get me to want to read what, what, what's this journey? How does he get from this to this? And this, this also helps us think cinematically. Notice, like, these are one to two sentences. Um, I even break up the sentences so that we're implying that there's this crawl. Is This also implies like the, the length of time that this uh, this shot is going to take place. We got the title. We got the super. We got the platoon stands. And the thing of it is, is notice that this didn't really change the story at all. Uh, this is the, the story alone, I think, is really interesting. I, I really want to know what happened to William. Uh, and it implies that there's some sort of thing. The fact that it's called Tressa or Teresa, um, it, like it, it, it implies that there's like a really strong character motive that, that, that something's going to happen that is going to completely turn this guy's life upside down. So, um, okay. That's our two scripts for the day. I hope that helps you. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the scripts. Um, I think they all started off with really strong ideas. Go find The Fall, Peter Bridges, if you just Google the PDF. It's an excellent, ideal example of uh, what you want for, for great cinematic storytelling, for great cin cinematic writing. So remember, tomorrow registration opens, and on the 13th, we're going to be having this live scene structure breakdown. We're going to do a deep dive into the mechanics, and it's going to be a really great live experience, and we'll have a Q&A afterwards. I really hope you can join us. Thanks for watching The Art of Story. You've got a story inside you. A screenplay no one has ever thought of. A novel you've been rolling around inside your coconut for years. Maybe you wrote a few pages and stalled out. Maybe you even wrote a whole draft but don't feel confident it's any good. Or maybe you've been writing draft after draft after draft and slamming into writer's blocks or dead ends or wandering into the weeds. Maybe you just have a few scenes centered around some dope high concept but you don't know how to develop a character, much less construct a plot that would generate a character arc. Maybe all you have is some simmering spark of an idea. Just a simple desire to write a story. This book is for you. Story by Numbers is a step-by-step -step process. It gives you the tools to construct a plot that fleshes out your story with characters so real, so compelling, so multi-dimensional, you begin to wonder if you're possessed. Story by Numbers is composed of three parts. 
Part 1 gives you an overview of the 4-act structure, 24 plot points, 8 sequences. Part 2 is a 35-question examination of your story that will guide you through developing and outlining your novel or screenplay into the 4-act template. Part 3, well, that's just next-level dope shit. This isn't just another book on theory. Story by Numbers is a diagnostic toolkit for developing and fine-tuning your story. You'll also want to pick up the Story by Numbers workbook. For each story you're writing, you'll need a journal to organize your ideas. The Story by Numbers workbook is a companion notebook that walks you through the process as you outline your story and guide you through each phase of development. From constructing your protagonist's internal drive, to plotting conflicts that expose character, to composing scenes that drive compelling stories. By the time you've completed your story by number workbook, you'll be ready to finish your manuscript. Whenever you ask a writer what it takes to write a good story, they usually say there are no rules. If you want to know what they really think, ask them about a novel or movie they hate. Immediately they'll unload a litany of do's and don'ts so specific, so precise you'd think they're citing commandments. We all know following a formula is what turns stories into zombified, hacky imitations of better stories. You don't want a formula. You want a process. A method composed of practical principles that breathe life into your concept. You don't want some bullshit magical key. You just want to know what works and what doesn't. Does your story resonate or not? Everyone knows there are no rules for writing a great story. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, here are the rules. Story by numbers. Write more, better, faster, doper.